Right, welcome, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'd like to talk today about uh, progress and plans for a strategic plan for the NHGRI genome sequencing program. Now, you've seen drafts of this before, uh, and I think it's moving on towards time to begin to implement it. And I just want to start with an overview of where we are now with the program. Some of this has come up, uh, came up in the in uh, uh, Dr. Green's talk this morning. Um, the genome sequencing program has these four components, uh, which Eric described. These are the uh, these are the current budgets. The large scale sequencing and analysis centers is that this per year and headed down. You'll see that in a second. Centers for Mendelian Genomics at $12 million a year. Uh, some of this is from NHLBI co-funding, clinical sequencing exploratory centers. CSER is 19.2, and some of this is from uh, NCI, uh, Genome Sequencing Informatics Tools. And the program uh, was funded for four years in early FY12 uh, uh, with, uh, with the second round for CSERs in 13. Uh, this just shows the amount of funding over time. This is in, uh, this is in uh, year by year dollars. Uh, Curves year by year dollars is actually coming down in 2013 dollars from uh, from over 200 million dollars of funding uh, down to its current uh, 80 80 and a bit uh, and headed down by five percent per year and in red bars is production it's not that there was no production in these years you just can't see it compared to these this production um, and everybody everybody knows what happened around here. Uh, and this boom, and even with this very significant uh, drop in funding from the last, uh, last time we renewed, um, there's only been a bit of a drop in sequencing, and actually it looks like we're on course to go, uh, start going up again, but I will reserve judgment until I see it. Um, this is just uh, two different plots of, uh, two very similar plots. This one is the uh, last four quarters, this one's just this quarter, showing uh, production by project type, and at this point we're mostly medical sequencing. Uh, and, uh, and a lot of cancer sequencing, um, a little bit of organismal sequencing, um, some thousand genomes still going on in the last quarter for which we have records. We're actually into the next quarter from this, but this is where, it, where we have complete data. Um, and it's pretty stable at this point in these proportions. <laughs> there are a lot of active uh, sequencing projects at large scale. Um, uh, there are, in the last five quarters, the program has touched uh, 21 complex disease uh, projects, 16 Mendelian. I put them in quotes because they're not all strictly Mendelian. There's kind of a blur between complex and Mendelian. 33 cancer, including ATCGA. Many organisms, well over 100 organismal projects, touched at least in the last uh, in the last five quarters for microbial and thousand genomes. And I just want to. Uh, you can't see all of these, and this is actually a really nice live table. You can open some of these up and look at everything we did, and we'll eventually post something like this uh, uh, in, a, in a better place so anyone can take a look at it. Um, uh, but uh, I just want to point out some of these larger ones, 47 and 43 deposited past uh, mega uh, terabases for those, and that's uh, a schizophrenia project and a uh, diabetes multi-ethnic cohort project. Those are two, two fairly recent, very large projects that would not have been possible uh, five or six years ago. And of course, this is TCGA, which is a composite of eight projects right now, which is uh, over 58 terabases uh, at the time that these data were collected. I, I, I should go back just a little bit and say, um, there's two things I wanted to say. I'm obviously talking about the large scale se right now about the large scale sequencing um, and analysis program, um, but throughout this talk, I'll be I'll be sort of moving back and forth between other elements of the program and large scale. But I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about large scale because the large scale component is the one that is in some ways deliberately least defined um, by its grant proposals. Um, I mean, it's obviously obviously carefully planned, but designed in order to take advantage of the opportunities as they change, and they change very, very quickly. Um, that said, at the beginning of the talk, you'll hear me talk about the current, this whole thing about in terms of the current structure of the program. But as I move on, uh, it, the talk will get more and more agnostic about the current structure, and you'll see why at the end. So there are many different project types at multiple scales. Uh, these projects were chosen in a number of ways through community input, uh, collaboration, center initiated. Uh, we initiated some of these. Um, they are all vetted by uh, NHGRI staff, by our sequencing advisors, some of whom are here today. 
uh, and for many of the larger projects uh, by council. Um, and what is important and possible and appropriate uh, for the program all change rapidly. So really because of this last point, we're constantly changing. And even though I'm giving a talk today about a new plan, in fact, this is in a sort of continuum uh, with the kinds of planning we've just been forced to do in order to keep the program um, staying, keeping ahead of the opportunities. And we just have to be, do more than uh, predict these opportunities and, and stay on top of the changes. We have to actually try to drive them. That's the whole, whole point of the program. And that led us uh, to Disease 2020. So I think we had come to, over the, over the past couple years, with all the increase in sequencing capacity and the increasing attention on the medical sequencing and complex cancer and then complex disease, we asked the centers to draft a proposal about the best opportunities. Uh, and these are opportunities explicitly from the point of view, uh, 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 from on the genomics of human disease from the point of view of, uh, of uh, genome sequencing. Again, it's a strategic framework for genome sequencing initially put forward by the large-scale sequencing analysis centers. We had a workshop for input in January, which included representatives from all the center, from all the sequencing uh, components, uh, actually from, sorry, from CSER and CMG um, and others. Um, the output of the workshop was refined, including there was one round of council comments already. Um, and also uh, went through uh, the efforts of an editing team, who, who you'll see at the end. Um, and just to say that we intend to use the resources of the program, of the sequencing program, over the next 18 months to demonstrate the feasibility and the value of the Disease 2020 plan that was proposed. So what is it and why now? Obviously, discovering genes underlying human diseases is fundamental. It's fundamental to, to what we do, and it's a fundamental, a fundamental scientific importance. There's been a lot of progress in terms of technology and knowledge, but we're still at the beginning. I think everyone, everyone realizes that. We're far, far from uh, knowing what we're doing. And it really is time to use the tools that we've developed um, uh, to systematically define um, the basis for human disease. And if there's one thing that I take away from Disease 2020 is is sort of the realization that doing this is now almost entirely technically feasible. It's, it's arguably, you know, or not more or less practical. There, it's not that every problem has been solved to doing this, but by and large, it looks technically feasible to do that. This is not a project that can be done solely by NHGRI, obviously. I can only talk today about the part uh, that we want to do, that we would like to do. Um, you'll see immediately it depends critically on other ICs. Um, that's where the samples are. That's where a lot of the domain expertise is. Um, and we can't move very much farther on this without, without many strong collaborations. Fortunately, we already have some. However, we're in a good place to, to lead this just by virtue of our history with large-scale sequencing. So I'm going to apologize here for the use of the word domains because it's been used in another context today. I don't want you to get confused. These are not the same domains as our NHGRI strategic plan domains. These are five domains of D2020. So the first is to identify the key genetic factors contributing to 100 important common diseases. It's important to have a, a big ambitious number here. I think you'll see why and a, a, a big round number. Um, identify the genes underlying essentially all Mendelian diseases is domain two. Domain three is identify the genes that drive cancer initiation, progression, and treatment response in all significant cancer types. Domain four is identify microbes and their communities that cause and correlate with disease. And five is to really push harder into genomics in the clinical and healthcare setting, which, which we're doing, obviously, you've heard of other programs discussed today that are doing that as well. So domain 100 common diseases. Again, uh, GWAS has discovered hundreds of loci. There's a lot of missing heritability. Causal variants are largely still unknown. Uh, sequencing approaches directly uh, 
directly assay the full range of these, uh, full range of complexity, heterogeneity, the full spectrum, common to bear of variance. Um, there's plenty of places to start. There are projects already ongoing. I showed you that long list, and you obviously didn't have time to look at all of them. It was too small anyway, but we can start with these are ongoing projects. There's an autism project, an Alzheimer's disease project that we've talked about in extensively previous councils, early onset MI, uh, schizophrenia is another big project, several cancers, chronic kidney disease. Uh, also, there are also disease endophenotypes that could be subject of study. Um, importantly, for many of these, we know that there are sufficient samples to do these. And I, I can't emphasize the samples stuff enough. It's the major practical constraint to doing a lot of these projects. Um, in order to get power, I mean, you've seen the, you've seen the Alzheimer's disease plan already, and that, that's 10,000 10, cases plus controls. Um, uh, other complex disease studies are likely to need samples like that. People ask me really, really 100 diseases, complex diseases that we could even go after or that could be gone after. This is a, a slide from Terry. Um, you can't see all of these, but these are traits with published, with published GWAS, GWAS studies. So 331 of those. Um, some of these are not disease traits. You'll, you'll notice immediately, but there probably are 100 in here that could be picked up. Um, I did a different cut of these. I just went back to the data from the GWAS catalog, and and I'm I'm Terry is more of a lumper than I than I turn out to be. Um, I split these. I, I got more more categories, but I mostly just wanted to see where where the um, less explored territory where 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 might be a good place to go. And I looked. The blue bars are actual disease phenotypes, and the red bars are are uh, endophenotypes. You could argue one. And then the phenotype might really be a disease phenotype. Um, and I divided up amongst a, a number of categories, disease categories. Um, and you can see there's an awful lot in pharmacogenomic. Um, there's uh, a lot in cancer. Um, and this is heritable cancer that could be gone after, uh, heritable basis of cancer that could be gone after. Um, a lot of um, sort of neuropsychiatric, neurological. It's an interesting area and autoimmune and allergy. Uh, um, I think we've got a number of studies in cardiovascular already, but there's still, uh, still more to be done. Um, there are a lot of interesting non-disease phenotypes. Um, some of them are more clearly related to health than others, and I think those would have to be looked at quite carefully to figure out what might be profitable there. Um, this is point again about adequate power. We're going to need thousands of samples. Um, to learn about how to best to do all of these. We don't just want to do you know, one, one or two. Um, we want to really learn and establish how to, how to nail these down as best, the best ways to nail these down. So th this is kind of a key idea here. We need to do comprehensive projects. We have and others have a number of um, initial projects over the last few years as permitted by sequencing capacity and samples that are sequencing 1,000 here and 1,000 there. And depending on how they design them and what the disease architecture is, they're learning things. But these don't look, a lot of these don't look like comprehensive studies, at least, at, at least right now they don't look like comprehensive studies. Um, we also need to try diseases with multiple architectures um, to understand what the differences in design might be. Um, very likely, uh, these would be multi-component mixed studies. Uh, for example, they would include case control, maybe families, maybe some targeted sequencing, whole genome, and others. Uh, we would explore both case control and cohort designs. Um, this is an important area. Um, we need to pilot large-scale studies where recontacting and rephenotyping is possible. It's a real limitation of current sample sets that you often, of many current sample sets, that you often can't do that. Uh, and finally, we need to push the transition from whole exome sequencing to whole genome sequencing. That's in the midst of happening right now. I'm sure you've heard many things about about this, about the cost of whole genome sequencing and the best possible cost and uh, the advantages. Um, it's not just cost limited. Another major, uh, probably the one of the biggest technical hurdles that at least I can predict right now for whole genome sequencing is the analysis tools are lacking for, anal for analyzing whole genome sequence. You'll hear a little bit more about that in, uh, in Lisa's presentation. In domain two, genomic basis for essentially all Mendelian disease. Um, uh, this is technically feasible now for many Mendelian diseases, especially the ones with, uh, with clear patterns of inheritance. Uh, the Centers for Mendelian Genomics and other groups are already doing this and will continue. Um, there are opportunities to expand this to invest more complex modes of inheritance, so uh, um, 
um, disorders that are Mendelian but with high allelic heterogeneity, um, looking for de novo mutation screening in large populations. Another, in, another opportunity to explore this genotype uh, to phenotype design if you can recontact and rephenotype patients, uh, sorry, uh, participants. Um, in domain three, uh, cancer initiation, progression, and treatment response in all significant cancer types. We are, we are well along the way uh, with TCGA, and this would continue in alliance with NCI. We are in regular contact with them about this. They were at this small meeting. They had um, some direct input into the D2020 document. Um, but there's more to do. So completing the catalog of characterized tumor types for primary tumors. Um, we don't know very little about progression in tumor heterogeneity or treatment response. Uh, and there are a number of animal models that could be characterized. In domain four, microbial basis of disease, uh, we know this is important for disease. Establishing causality remains a major challenge. Um, in, uh, according to the plan in D2020, Disease 2020, uh, we would pilot, at least to begin with, a small number of studies uh, in the context of complex disease. We frequently get this question. You're doing, you know, you're looking into so many complex diseases why don't you just take one of those disease studies and have associated with it uh, a microbiome project? And the problem, again, is that the samples very frequently aren't, uh, they're not sampled. The microbiome is not sampled. You can't go back um, and sample over time, which is really the kind of thing that you need to do. So because samples are so limiting, we have practical worries about, about doing a lot of this in a short period of time, but we have, we have uh, no question that it's going to be important. In the meantime, there's still lots to be done developing reference sequences and tools, including analysis tools, for detecting uh, uh, microbiome components. Domain five, sequencing in the clinical and healthcare setting, and this is clearly where a lot of, a lot of us want to be. Um, the CSER program and other programs uh, at NHGRI are already addressing this. Um, there are opportunities to push farther in this direction, and, and here I'll be a little bit agnostic about the right way to do this, um, uh, but, uh, but at scale, there are certain kinds of things that you can do to combine clinical and discovery. And it needs a lot more thought, but some examples, uh, newborn screening combined with allele discovery or uh, uh, tumor sequencing um, uh, along with to, to guide treatment or assess response along with gene discovery, and there are other opportunities along this line. So implementation is kind of in three phases. So one is what, what we need to do now, in fact, what we need to already be doing, and this is this notion of demonstration projects, and you especially saw some examples of demonstration projects in that domain one. We can get going right now, in fact, we already are going with large domain one, two, and three projects. We can sort of reframe the ones we're already doing uh, into these demonstration projects. There are still, as I showed you, a lot of smaller projects. Um, they're clusters that are related. There's probably a productive way to consolidate some of those small projects and, and sort of move them towards being disease 2020. But this needs a lot of a detailed discussion about the science. Again, uh, lots to start with already, schizophrenia, autism, Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, a few others. The next stage over the next roughly 18 months, uh, we really need to get uh, additional input, especially from other ICs at NIH, about what large sample sets there are, what else is being supported, um, about possible collaborations. Again, we're already, with all the large projects, any large project I showed you has already required such collaborations um, with NHLBI, with, um, with um, um, NCI, with NIA. Uh, we would like to start identifying additional projects, especially in domain one. Um, we need to start getting the demonstration project data, and I think this is already coming from, from uh, schizophrenia and type 2D genes and other large projects. Um, and think about how we would design pilot projects for domains four and five and begin them if possible sometime over the next 18 months. 18 months from now, we need to go back, come back to all of this and assess feasibility and progress from the demonstration projects. Are we really able to, I mean, both the practical and the scientific? And ask again, are these goals still well justified? And then 
ask ourselves, uh, what's the right program structure to achieve this if we, if we believe that this is feasible and, and well justified, adds a lot of value. So this is a, an overview of the implementation timeline. This is now, start demonstration projects, community input, gather data, seek new projects, design pilots for the, for the domains three and four, and I should say possibly five. Sorry, it should be four and five. Can't count. Um, in 2015, we will have a meeting uh, to ask the question, is D2020 still justified? Is it feasible? And what's the best way to do it? And in 2016, the entire sequencing program is slated for renewal. And this will be the input into how this is aimed and structured. With that, I want to acknowledge uh, all the folks who have helped out with this. So uh, from NHGRI, all these folks, uh, especially want to uh, um, thank Deborah. Uh, for help putting together some of the data slides and, and Chris. And uh, these folks were the domain editors for the D2020 document. Um, and Carlos is here today. And with that, I'd like to open it up for comments and questions. And I'll start with Didi, since you've been here for most of this. Well, I think you gave a good overview and kind of history of how we got to this. Um, maybe just mentioned that one of the things was to in light of the strategic plan for genomics and then taking advantage of the sequencing centers, how can we best utilize all these resources and capability? So I think this is a good uh, direction to be heading in and, and really how the implementation is done is critical. I like the idea of the demonstration projects. I think doing some with the, what's in the pipelines now is good, but also maybe developing a bigger, longer-term demonstration project could also be very useful to um, really demonstrate how we can get a better understanding of a disease and, and what we can do about it. So, thanks. thanks. And uh, Carlos? I think you did a fantastic job of encapsulating what's been months and months of calls and meetings. So um, this went through many, many, many different rounds, and, you know, I think the, the final document really does encapsulate what's a pretty exciting vision for what can be done with sequencing to address public health concerns and disease across the spectrum, given the reality of constraints, right? I mean, in, in, in an ideal world, of course, we'd just do massive whole genome sequencing, and it would all be integrated in electronic medical records. Given where we are now, what can we do? And given the collections that existed, you know, I think the idea of leveraging existing investments across the NIH into other cohorts is such a no-brainer that we need to figure out how to make that happen. Yes. Um, I'm going to be the devil's advocate, recognizing that even the devil's advocate sometimes has sympathy for the devil. So um, it, it, it and from being outside this, I can sort of look at it and listen to it, and this is really the first time that I've heard this presented. So I worry about a couple of things. One is I worry about that what we, what we have is a large infrastructure looking for a mission, and it's, it smacks a little bit of that. Number two is I'm very concerned about using existing uh, cohorts and samples as convenient samples that really lack the deep phenotype information that we need to really understand this. I'm concerned that this is going to take us the same place that GWAS did, which is some good, solid information, no question about it, but with huge questions left at the end, unless we also add in the epidemiological aspect of this. And third is I do have a lot of uh, sympathy with the idea of not having the domains all separate, but try to have cross-domain studies where we do look at, for example, at autism and the um, microbiome, or Parkinson's disease and the microbiome, because I think we're missing a huge facet of the pathophysiology of some of these disorders if we don't combine these domains. Yeah, so let me, let me start from your last point first. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I agree with you. I think it's not just uh, complex disease and microbiome. It is... Um, it's complex disease and some of those other areas. There's plenty of opportunities. And the way that I stated this and the way that D2020 is written, it, 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 
talks, it says that they're not supposed to be clear boundaries and that there's plenty of opportunities, but it doesn't really demonstrate it by giving examples of kinds of projects. Maybe if you get to the higher domains, if you look in the medical, in the clinical, it t talks about more, more explicitly. Um, I think there are potentially those opportunities. What I'm worried about is if there are not the samples, what needs to be started today is getting those samples. And we already have a large-scale sequencing program, um, and uh, a se more than just large-scale sequencing program, and it's going, it's going until it's going until 2016 already. They're already engaged in some of these. So this is, this is not uh, uh, self-preservation. This is what's already, what's already going on. This is what's already funded. And uh, it does have to get better definition on the question. And I agree with you. It is hard to separate the question from the current structure. But we have to, we have to do that. And we have to concentrate. We have to concentrate on whether the goals are possible, and we have to explore issues like, are there the right phenotypes out there? I know that from the Alzheimer's disease project, there's there's been a lot of thought. I mean, literally a year of uh, of practically weekly meetings talking about getting the right samples, and much of that has to do with the deep phenotyping. I know the same discussions have gone on with, and and this is a practical. During the demonstration project phase, this is a very practical and critical issue to get ironed out. Um, again, to go back, yeah, when we get to this stage, we really have to ask, is this still the right focus, and what's the right structure to do this? I, I want to point, I'll get to Pamela in a second, I want to point out that, for example, in domain five, I don't, I don't think that there's any component, any single component of the sequencing program overall that's ideally suited to do some of those things. So I think that needs that needs some real thought. And Pamela, following up on your uh, focus on the program assessment uh, in 2015, have the criteria by which the uh, program will be assessed been developed? No, we, we have to do that with we have to do that with the help of you guys on the uh, on the SAP. Yes, um, you've chosen some very interesting diseases to start with, and I would say those that have been refractory to many other genetic approaches like schizophrenia and autism. So there's always an argument out there of what's causing the missing heritability. So I, I hope that there will be pilot demonstrations with the, the exim and whole genome sequencing to def define how much extra yield you're getting for the investment, because yeah. if it gains another 5 or 10 percent of cases defined by a DNA change, fine, but if I'd hate to see the herd effect of everyone jumping off the cliff that we have to sequence thousands and thousands more with whole genome sequencing because the missing heritability is out there somewhere, rather than pausing and trying to decide whether we got our assumptions wrong or there's other biological mechanisms we need to identify, such as whether there's a microbiome interaction. I've seen this at every stage of the genome. We either blame the technology or we blame the phenotype. But the question is that we really got our assumptions right about the heritability of these disorders. Yes. So, so I understand why you, you can't uh, go and recruit the, the right cohort, uh, if, if you will. Um, so I wonder whether you've reached out to things like the, the UK, the large UK study or some of the other, other initiatives where you can kind of get part of what you're missing. Um, in that way. So you know, they're doing their own thing, they're doing it in a very different way. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways it's complementary because you're going to be digging deeper and have better phenotype for each disease, but they're going to have the broad into phenotype and, and other just broad data. So it seems like right. that might be a way of getting both without having to spend the extra money. And I know it's complicated, but um, it, it seems like a, a way to consider. Yeah, I agree. And we're going to have to take advantage of every opportunity that there is like that, including internally there's eMERGE as well. Um, Terry, do you want to talk about uh, UK Biobank? Internally as well as with the sequencing centers about uh, UK Biobank, which is 500,000 people. 
um, characterized fairly extensively at baseline and then followed up in their medical records. Uh, there was not a lot of enthusiasm for pursuing it. Rick may want to comment on, on that as well. Um, and we've continued to be in contact with the, uh, the biobank folks, mainly to make sure that the samples would be and data would be available. And um, uh, they said, absolutely, there's no reason that we couldn't post these either in dbGaP or have a link from dbGaP to the, to the Wellcome Trust. So, so it seems like a real opportunity to be able to, to do this. Yeah, I mean, you, you would come to the party with something. Yes. And right now, you come, you're come, you not coming with anything, and they don't have anything. Right. Um, once both parties have something, then you can put it together. So I think that's... Yeah, yeah and they, they're um, in, embarking on an effort to do the um, the kind of the exome chip backbone on, on the um, biobank cohort, probably not the entire 500,000, but um, a, a sample of them initially, uh, and, then, and then use that to impute. Um, if they can sequence a, a smaller proportion, but uh, but they are getting some funding there, and it would be awfully nice, I think, if we could be involved in that. Uh, I'm sorry, the lack of enthusiasm was from from whom? So so I'll I won't say from whom, uh, but I will interpret about what. Okay. Okay. So it it's sort of related to the same sets of que kinds of questions that people have been asking, including your question. Um, if, if the point is just, is only to sequence um, without regard to um, sets of individuals that could be informative because of their phenotype, there's not enthusiasm. I think in general, um, in general, if there is a way to, um, to for example, consolidate uh, some of the phenotypes um, in similar phenotypes, and there are sufficient numbers, there would be enthusiasm. And uh, I think that you also, the, the degree of enthusiasm that you get, of course, depends on exactly who you ask. Um, so so uh, can I interpret what you're saying then is two things. One is that it's a cohort, not a case control. And secondly, that it's EMR as the source of phenotype as opposed to a scientifically rigorous phenotype. Is that? I, I was saying something less less than that. Actually, I was just saying that that the prospect of simply con of contributing only capacity to that, rather than trying to ask some of these questions, with that uh, was was less. It seemed to be less attractive. Well, I mean, you know, at at the risk of of uh, conflict of interest, there is the Northern California Kaiser project, and I think that should also be considered as a source of, of uh, material. Well, well over 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. I'm not involved in it, but people I work with are. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, Carlos. Just to make a small addition to the, the UK Biobank, which I think is a, is a great resource, uh, one of the points that's laid out in the document is the need to have um, a portfolio of different populations and the importance of having a multi-ethnic design. And so you know, that, that's one, one potential population, but of course you'd need to um, make sure that we'd had good representation, particularly of ethnic minorities in the United States as, as part of this. Um, and I think the, the other point is uh, to think about how this is really one of the first starting efforts to do the large scale sequencing to drive down into rare variants with the realization that doing rare variant association is turning out to be far harder than we had expected. And so in order to do that correctly, we need a concerted effort. And if we can get um, a portfolio of diseases under a systematic sequencing uh, approach, then we do a, a better job of maximizing our chances of finding a set of associations as opposed to dividing up what could be the sequencing budget or whatever budget you want to invest in this across a set of uncoordinated projects, if that's the uh, alternative. So I, I think that's part of the rationale, and I, you know I think the driving idea here is let's not let not the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? This is a logical thing to try, and we'll see over the demonstration projects how it works, and then take a mid-course correction. Salam. Um, question for Terry while you're still up here: How far are we along apropos of this very context uh, driving emerge for G2P recontact? Well, so, so an eMERGE recontact is, is generally no problem. There's one cohort that it, it can't be done, and is that's in Is it fed in, in here, then? So this uh, yes, yes. So that, that is part of the discussion as well, um, uh, and it could easily be done. 
It could. It, yes. it could be. It could be. Where I mean, you need to have the resources, and you need to and you need to recontact the people and bring them back in. But um, for the most part, the, these people these are people that are undergoing care at the various emerge centers, so they're already engaged, uh, very much like the Kaiser cohort, which is people undergoing care at, at Kaiser. Pamela. You know, reading over the um, this version of the report, uh, a phrase that comes up repeatedly is large numbers, large numbers. We have to have large numbers, and that's across the write-up of domains one, two, and three that's emphasized. And I know that, um, I guess it was at the January meeting, there was some data that actually had lists of where the samples were and how many they had, and there were certain uh, conditions that seem to have already a, a pretty robust set of samples. But I guess what I'm wondering is, um, has there been in the last several months an attempt to go through and to really identify where those samples are? I mean, so talking about, yes, you could do Kaiser, yes, you could do UK Biobank, but if you're talking about an 18-month timeline, presumably you're talking about samples that we already know are um, uh, quality samples and that we have access to. So is there was there an assessment that actually went through and uh, looked? Not. Oh. For, for individual projects, yeah, so in particular for Alzheimer's, but, but no, not for others, and we really need to have that discussion and, and a number of others. Yes, David. So I agree completely with the importance of all the goals that are laid out. I, two real questions. One, one is um, overlap, right? So uh, if you just, let's just pick Mendelian disease as an example where there's separate investments being made in Mendelian uh, disease centers. And it just it wasn't clear to me how the Mendelian diseases picked for part of 2020 would be delineated from those that are ongoing at the, the, the other Mendelian centers. So I, I don't think there's a need to delineate. I think all of them, all of them get, uh, get reframed. Um, because the problem gets looked at at a higher level, and all of that data are are useful. I think that the question that I've asked is actually a level uh, a level uh, more detailed than that, uh, which isn't whether or not this should be a goal, but um, but actually has to do with the, the the dynamics between the CMGs and the LSACs, and what's appropriate for each. And believe me, Lou Lou uh, uh, and I talk almost every week about what the right boundary is and where the real opportunities are uh, for expanding to something that that is appropriate uh, for the large-scale centers. But but who who does it in some ways is, a, is the next level of detail down. Uh, that it should be done and defining what kinds of projects those are is more the point. Well, I guess that's related to my other question, which just does have to do with timelines, because 18 months is a very short timeline. Uh, you mentioned there was almost a year of discussions about the Alzheimer uh, sample cohort, right? Mm -hmm. And that's one thing um, as an example of how long it may take to, you know, to, to I, I realize that was a particularly problematic one. But um, the, it just doesn't seem like there's very much time to um, identify the targets, collect the samples, and get the data in a way that is going to make it possible to inform. Um, the 2015 uh, uh, decision about how best to proceed. So, so I agree with you, and that's that's why it's good that we have some large projects that are already underway. A lot of the smaller projects probably aren't going to be adequate on their own. Maybe if some of them can be combined and analyzed together, we'll get some additional mileage out of those. But I agree with you, even uh, even if we had all the samples today. I'll give you an example, Alzheimer's disease. It's not on that table because at the time I produced that table, there's no data. Data are just beginning to come out. Um, by the time, by 15, 16, 18 months from now, we'll have all the data. I doubt we'll have a lot of the analysis done. Maybe for the family samples, we'll have the analysis done. So I agree with you. It's a very short timeline, and we're going to have to make the most uh, out of the projects that we already have, like, like schizophrenia, autism, uh, uh, Type 2D genes that are that where the data is already collected. Essentially, we're going to have to get a lot of mileage out of those, and uh, we'll have to assess it every step of the way whether we're giving this a realistic test. 
we, we're not going to be probably the, also the only ones doing projects like mm -hmm. this. And so there may be information coming in from elsewhere. Haras. The, the projects you just mentioned, you know, the, the Alzheimer's and, and uh, schizophrenia and so forth, you and others around the table know better than me, have been almost intractable. And in 2015, there's going to be a program assessment based on whether or not the sequencing. I'm, wonder, I, I'm wondering, are you setting yourself up for an extremely difficult time at program assessment. Is this realistic? I mean, I, I'm sort of in general in favor of what you've been talking about, but the this more most recent discussion is bringing all kinds of concerns yeah. to my head. Yeah, I, I'd like to get into this more in the closed session okay. when we talk about implementation in more detail, but yeah, it's, uh, it's been noted by others. All right, thank you, Adam. Thank you. So that's it for the reports and presentations. We're now going to move on to a concept clearance. Uh, this will be from uh, Lisa Brooks, Program Director of the Genetic Variation Program. Concept is titled Interpreting Variants in Non-Coding Regions of the Genome.